Okay, so this is... Well, this is an interesting Patreon question. It really was. It's a Sydney strategy. When looking for a Far East naval base, why is Sydney not Singapore? And this was put forward by Michael66. So, this will come out after the live, which might have had a similar guest star from the senior fluffy research assistant, who, as you can see, is very enthralled and very much assisting. You are. You're cute. But it's also... How do I put this? It's an interesting point of view to consider from the perspective of... It explains a lot of why Singapore is in the place it is, but also... Going into this alternate history explains a lot of why Singapore ends up in the state it does. Because there are a lot of problems. There are a lot of problems with British strategy and British strategic thinking. We like to think, we often like to kid ourselves that short-termism in, in any government's political view is something new. Sadly, it isn't. Sadly, short-termism is always there. With elected politicians and elected leaderships, they invariably think about the next election because, in the nicest way, or from one perspective, they can't do anything if they're not elected. So if they don't win the next election, they can't in power to change anything. From the other perspective, of course, it's uh, if politicians think further than the next election, they run the risk of losing the next election and uh, run the risk of losing their power and prominence in the position they love. Honestly, it's probably a spectrum. And everyone's an individual within that spectrum. But this is the interesting thing when we start to consider alternatives to Singapore. Shane's book plug. Thank you as ever for everyone's support. It's people who watch the videos, who sit through those adverts or are Prime members, people who subscribe to the channel, people who share the channel, people who are members of the channel, people who are patrons, and people who buy my books or rather this book which is out currently, there are new book there are other books coming, they will come. The juggling backs and forwards everything has meant that some things have had to be delayed, but they will come. Thank you. Because A, I enjoy producing history so that people can enjoy it, re reading it and sharing my passion. But B, none of this would be possible without support, your support. None of this, none of the work, none of the videos, none of the research trips, not the public liability insurance, which allows me to go to museums and do recording, not the, well, not its current form, uh, not the independent JSTOR account I now run, which, you know, I have an independent subscription to JSTOR because, frankly, it makes sense. It stops me having to rely on universities, which sometimes do all sorts of fun things with contract lecturers. So all that is possible because of you. So thank you. Brent, speaking of JSTOR, I thought with this one, it'd be fun to talk about some background sources and also to mute my mobile phone. Why is, yeah. Okay, so Ian Hamill, Winston Church on the Singapore Naval Base, 1924-1929. A gigantic excuse for building up armaments. That was the Journal of Southeast Asian Studies in 1980. W. David McIntyre. Strategic Significance of Singapore, 1917-1942. The Naval Base on the Commonwealth. Journal of Southeast Asian History, 1969. Nicholas Roosevelt, The Strategy of Singapore. Foreign Affairs, January 1929. Christopher M. Bell, The Singapore Strategy and Deterrence of Japan. Winston Churchill, The Admiralty and Dispatch of Force Z. June 2001. Tristan Burst, Naval Base of Singapore. April 1932. And published in the Pacific Affairs. And I've also added Eduardo Leon Meja. 
envisioning an imperial outpost, the colonial city and naval base of Singapore by Singapore in Anglo-American travel and world affairs writing 1900 to 1942. I'm not sure why I managed to write Days of Singapore twice in that one. Now, all these sources are great. All of them are really interesting. I don't agree with all of what they say, but I do find it interesting, and I have used quotes from some of them where relevant. I do recommend going and reading around topics, especially when you're doing things like this. Alternate histories, what-if histories, all these things, they counterfactual histories as well. They all are good things to use as a tool for examining history, but first of all, you have to really know your history. You really have to know what were the different levers going along here. Yeah. And one of the things I do have to say is I'm limited to an extent. Because whilst there are people I'm sure who would love to listen to me talk about this for 12 hours, the real realistic thing is if I put up a 12 hour video, it would probably not make it, uh, probably not make any money due to the logarithm for starters, but a few other things as well. And the thing is, I have to an extent think about that. So, 90 minutes to 2 hours is usually what I aim for with these videos. That's further reading. There are lots of books, there are some very good books, and I have a fair number with me. I would recommend this one, but it's a Rutledge book, so expect to pay a lot of money for it. They come up, they are expensive. Uh, even in Kindle form, I think that was, that's Far Flung Lines, by the way, but, which is edited by ne <coughs> uh, Keith Nielsen and Greg Kennedy. Last time I checked, the Kindle version was 48 quid. Don't look at the actual physical copies. They will be problematic. That caused you to wake up and start the idea of that much money on a book, didn't it? It did. I'm sorry. Go back to your sweet dreams. Don't worry, I won't make you have to start handing over biscuits. Good boy. Anyway. He's okay now. So. They are useful starting points. They are able to be accessed with a JSTOR system. And as I said, it's something you pay monthly for. I think, I think it's $24 it's priced at. I do not know the conversion that currently to pounds off the top of my head. But it's $24 a month, and yeah, I it starts off by saying it's going to be $19, and then they add on taxes and other things, and it works out to $24. It's like most things in life when they say, here's your subscription fee. When do you get to the final bit you're paying monthly, then, then it's, that's your subscription fee. But, of course, all this is about... All this basing, all these options are about where to deploy this, the battle fleet, the main fleet of the Royal Navy. In a war in the Far East, where do you deploy them to? Because that's what Singapore is about. Singapore is the theatre entry base, okay? It's not supposed to be the primary base. That's not the base the war is going to be waged from. There's people who come up with this idea of Britain's plan was to wage war from Singapore on Japan and to blockade Japan from Singapore and they couldn't do this because their ships don't have the range. Okay? That, that, the idea of that as a concept is giving you a furball. I do apologise. Stop eating your own wool. But the thing is, that wasn't the British plan. The British plan was more likely... Build up at Singapore, move forward, working working their way up the South China Sea, clearing that way. Move forward some more, get to Hong Kong. Once they've got Hong Kong and they've, re, re, uh, they've re-enabled Hong Kong, set Hong Kong up as a transitory base because they're going to move on to the next base. The next base is probably going to be Weihai Wei. Which is an area they're very familiar with. And from Weihai Wei, you can do a blockade on Japan. Now, I'll be getting into the whole strategy in a second. But this is the British idea, really. Now, the Far East strategy is a reflection of this. I have coloured in some of the empires as best I can. You've got a bit of the French, you've got a bit of the Brit you've got the British fairly well covered in. You've got That is my bed, you know. The Japanese and you've got the American. Uh, well, America, America itself. I even managed to get the Hawaii blue over there. And this is the point. This is what Britain's got to defend. This is what the British 
Empire is all about, but it's also what the Royal Navy is all about, defending all this. Now, the Far East strategy often comes in for the criticism, especially during its early years, and one of the good examples of this is the chief in, uh, commander in chief of the East Indies at the time, when it's been coming up within about 1924, Rear Admiral Sir Herbert Richmond. Uh, his line was, we are going to force Japan to surrender by cutting off her essential supplies. We cannot cut off her essential supplies until we defeat her fleet. We cannot defeat her fleet if it will not come out to fight. We shall force it to come out to fight by cutting off her essential supplies. And he was pointing out, of course, the logic was circular. Now, please note, I have a lot of time for Richmond. He goes on and becomes a historian. Uh, he becomes one of the noted theorists of his age. However... There is a very little interesting note from several officers at the time that one of his biggest criticisms, which he never wrote of the strategy, was that the commander-in-chief of the forces involved would be the commander-in-chief China Station, not the commander-in-chief East Indies Station. Now, let's start off with this. Herr Richmond is right, but he's sort of using the German scenario to try and make the case and there is a very big difference between Germany and Japan. Germany at this time has a lot of internal logistics, railways, canals, roads. It has land borders. In World War One, though, the blockade still did tremendous amount of damage and frankly if the British had managed to break, uh, break into the Baltic that would probably be all she wrote for Germany because cut off from Sweden, cut off from their supplies from Scandinavian countries, coming through the Baltic, they would have been in real trouble. Now, for Japan, things are different. Japan is an island nation. Japan has very little in the way of internal logistics. Almost everything goes externally. And the Navy being forced to come out and fight, that's quite likely. But we are going to cut off, uh, going to force Japan to surrender by cutting off our essential supplies. Yeah. You don't need to fight the Navy to do this. This is something Richmond is very good at focusing in on it. But he's missing out the sheer number of submarines which the Royal Navy wants as part of this strategy. The Royal Navy's plan for close blockade is mines and submarines. They got the fleet there because if your fleet comes out to fight, it's going to have to fight them. If it doesn't come out to fight, then the cruisers running around are going to mean sh make sure that any escorts you send out to try and defend against the submarines and the mines are going to get shot to pieces, and the submarines and mines are going to do their job. And remember, this is planned in the 1920s. It gets evolved as time goes on. But in the 1920s, this is a perfectly sensible, perfectly fine strategic consideration. And starting off from Singapore makes sense because it is the entry point. It's also the shield for the main primary route between India and Australia. However, there are other options. There are always other options. So where do you secure an empire the other side of the world from? Well, the options. India. If you want to base it in India, you can. Uh, the India and the... British Indian government are always curiously anti-naval uh, naval forces, anti-naval firepower. They don't like the base at Bombay. They don't like the facilities at Madras. They really would like certain other facilities moved. They don't like spending any money on naval affairs. They like to limit it all and put all money to other things. Honestly... The big thing they are always going is, of course, we supply the British Indian Army and we have this massive army. And that seems to be, to an extent, the end of their strategic thinking. If it's not to do with the the army, they don't want to know about it. This is one of the troubles when it comes to develop, to setting up the Royal Indian Air Force. This is one of the things that it comes with setting up all sorts of sections in India, is that the India has been so dominated by the... British Indian Army. That it's just completely focused on that. And honestly, trying to get money out of them to support things is frigging difficult. Despite that, Trin Connolly is really a serious consideration. <laughs> 
Bombay and Madras both had advantages, but Trim Connolly, if you take that, you are well inside British territory. You can easily make it to Singapore. You can easily get to Australia straight through the Indian Ocean without going through the Straits. You can easily defend India. It's a very, very defensive position. However, if that's your theatre entry point, you are going to expand the end of the theatre dramatically. Because you now are putting all your major dockyards, all your logistics hubs, all your communications hubs, your command centres, all the way over there. And you're planning on operating all the way over there. That's a long way. Okay, well, the Far East station comes in and goes, Hello. Right then. Oh, well, we have options. We have Way High Way, which everyone just looks at and goes, Yeah, no. That's, that's A, technically Chinese territory. B, it's frigging close to Japan. Uh, to Japan. It's the other side of Tsingtao, for starters, which is, or Kundo, which is the base they've taken off the Germans after World War One. And it's, um, well, to defend it, I think the growing estimate was you would need the British Indian Army. You would need a large chunk of the British Indian Army to be deployed to Wei Highway to make it in any way, shape or form defensible. Which in peacetime was not practical. In peacetime, that's not practical. Then Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong has some advantages. But it also is kind of like Gibraltar, in that it is a great location, but in terms of basing a large fleet there in the modern world, not really necessarily a good idea. You need to make a lot of investments in terms of water supplies, in terms of food storage, in terms of development of things, and you are going to be very, very close to Japan. And the other problem with both Hong Kong and Wei Highway is they are in the treaty zone. They are in the treaty area. That's not supposed to be developed. Singapore. Outside the treaty area. Already got some facilities out to develop. Got a fairly supportive local government. Governors change over and the governors are the major problem. Some of the governors in the British, uh, British governors coming from the, foreign co uh, from the um, colonial office just how do I put this plenty? They don't want to see the wood for the trees. They are so obsessed with, usually it's the economic prosperity of, and the social security in terms of not arming too many of their citizens for fear of what they might do. That they don't want to think about defense. Defence is not their problem. Defence is another department. And, yeah, they'll be fine. You'll be seeing more of that later when we get on to the political discussions. But, yeah. It's a constant. You will be fine. We'll be fine. Of course we'll be fine. It'll be okay. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Of course it'll be fine. There'll be no problems. No one will do anything. We're Britain. We're Britain. We're, we're fine. And then you have Australia. Well, you have a lot more than just Sydney as an option. You have Perth and you have Darwin. I have been to two out of three of those. Some was not happy that I went to two out of three of those. Perth is a lovely place. It's on the far... It's, you know, it's on the far coast. There. there. It's on the far coast. Sydney's over here. They each have their own advantages and disadvantages. Sydney has a far greater population base to start off of. Sydney has a far greater industrial base to start off with. But Perth does have a lot of resources. And you, if you set up the base in Perth, the Australian government would probably have bankrolled it dramatically. Even under the current considerations at the time. If you're considering Perth, it is...
so separate from the rest of Australia that the infrastructure and things that we need to build to connect into the rest, and the infrastructure be built because of the Navy being based there and the Navy Yard being built there, would have absolutely turbo boosted what also was happening in Perth at the time anyway. So, it's interesting, and yes, I have run out of iron brew. There are these other options. On top of all this, there is a very strong debate going on, and a strong debate going on between the Dominions within the, the Commonwealth, between the, the Empire. And you have a division starting to break out between Canada on one side and Australia and New Zealand on the other side. Now, in 1921, these people are all having this debate. You have Billy Hughes, you have Bill Massey. Billy Hughes is the far one, Bill Massey is this one. And then you have Arthur Megan. Now, with the startling eyes. I mean, look look at those eyes. It's like a... They are startling. All interesting characters. This is when you start to see a very big differential in the perspectives. And Canada really shows its power. Because Canada doesn't win the argument about Britain trying to uh, breaking the alliance with Japan or trying to disturb the alliance with Japan, but they cause such trouble that the alliance is allowed to be expire. Now, the thing is, this is actually against the interests of Australia and New Zealand, both of whom, as Billy Hughes put it, are... Uh, preferred and relied that the British Empire had a reliable friend in the Pacific. The inference was very clear. They didn't consider the US to be a reliable friend. The US's actions in World War One, and in terms of their joining, their ifing about and things, and then their withdrawal from the world meant it's actually an interesting phrase which is attributed to him at one point, but is is not really sure whether it is was him and whether he actually said or not was, but it does seem sound like his language in that America is a friend, true, but uh, America is a friend which is dealing with their own issues first, and therefore cannot be considered a reliable friend. I'm not sure about that one. It's an interesting point I found written in a note on a note. But, actually while I was in Australia. But, it does sound potentially like him. And it does sound sort of what the problem was going on. For Canada, they were worried that if they, if Britain continued to be allied with Japan, if there was still the British Empire was allied with Japan, then in any Anglo, in any American Japanese conflict, which they considered likely, and that's one of the really interesting things, they consider an American Japanese conflict quite likely, quite a lot of British people do. They get drawn into it, and they didn't want to be drawn into it because they felt America would squash them. So why am I talking about a debate in 1921 when I just said a strategy starts to come back in 1924? Because this is when the strategy is starting to be talked about. The British send Admiral Jellicoe on a fact-finding mission. He goes off as governor of New Zealand and does all sorts of things in the Far East. And from that, he starts coming up with a strategy. And they start to work out the strategy. And that's when they start talking about needing a base in the Far East. Needing a base for those operations. And the thing is, the Imperial Conference, the 1921 Imperial Conference, is about developing that strategy. It's about working out, putting meat on the bones of it. 
it's about them trying to work out what they need to do. It shows the divisions within the empire, but also shows the things which are working. And the fact is, one of the reasons why the empire does transition into the Commonwealth is because of conferences like this, where the leadership of those countries, which were developing as dominions and developing as part of the empire, were able to have a major influence on British affairs. I would add, though, there is also a growing realization within a large structure of the British strategic thinking um, organs, the strategic, you know, those who are thinking a long term, that if Japan finds itself in a conflict with Britain, and no, if Japan finds itself in a conflict with America, then Britain's going to have to get involved. Because they can't afford to have, especially once the treaties go through, the naval treaties, America humble Japan. And then America will be big enough that it could humble Britain. Because it'll have to grow that big to beat Japan. The moment you have a treaty system that locks in Britain and America at the same level, and Japan in permanent second place, if either one of those uses their claws of war to grow their forces to fight Japan, they will then have far more forces than the other one if they haven't grown it. And on top of that, they will have secured themselves the Far East, the dominant role in the Far East, which was a growing economic market at this time. And remember, whilst people like to start viewing the 1920s and 30s as the growth of capitalism and various forms of free market economics, etc. There is still a healthy dose of mercantilism going on in the world. There is still a healthy dose of the idea of those who control resources and populations, either informally or formally, are the ones who can make the most money. And that is a thought process which has to be considered. Now, these conferences were both a feature and a bug uh, of British imperial and British defence and foreign policy in that to a lot of outsiders they either interpreted them and honestly you can sometimes see both at play in various countries as them show as the <coughs> dominions showing giving show, for show protestations against the government British decisions and then uh, of course going with British decisions because they are just colonies or as examples that it was just about imminently break up it was about imminently go implode of course I was saying that the politics of Britain do have an impact a massive impact the internal politics of itself and its elections and its views on the world do have a massive impact on where it spends its money. And the thing is, any of the defense spending, the most of the money is always going to come from Britain. Because that's the biggest economy. And in many ways, the empire is structured in such a way to feed the British economy. It is. So, what was going on in the UK at this time? And... Well, here we get the lovely Viscount Wimborne, and this is a speech he gives in 1923. Now, please note, when Churchill starts off in the early 1920s as Chancellor, he's actually in support of it. Later on, he goes against it. But in 1923, when he's well on his way trans to transitioning to being against the Singapore strategy, surprisingly enough, his cousin, who's in the House of Lords, does a massive speech against it, a massive speech, mahusive speech against it. And this is one of the paragraphs I've taken from Hansard. I want to ask, what is the objective of this naval base at Singapore? What is its purpose? And against what danger is it designed? It is a new proposal on the part of the Admiralty. We have the testimony of Mr. Asquith in another place. I, Parliament, House of Commons. That during all the years he presided over the Committee of Imperial Defence, the subject, although discussed, was never entertained by the committee. 
It is quite a new or comparatively new thing. Against what prospective enemy, against what danger in particular, is this new work designed? The First Lord of the Admiralty, in the speech to which I referred, said that there is in this course, of, of, this, of course, no suggestion of any difficulties in the relationship with Japan. If Japan is excluded, it's difficult to see what particular peril friends our interests in the Pacific. No, they do not, sadly enough, have an IQ test for joining the House of Lords or even the House of Commons. It's supposedly winning elections. I don't know a few other things, but, um, yeah. So. Where's this coming from? Well... Let's start taking this particular paragraph to pieces, shall we, as politics. It's basically they don't want to spend the money on defense. They want to spend the money on other things which will, might win the next election. This is what they're worrying about, because they're worrying about labor. Labor have already caused issues, and they're worrying about losing the social, uh, the what they call the, uh, the solid working class vote. Now, I would say there's a few small problems. One, there's been an increasing and widening in the franchise and various other things going on. Which means a lot more people are voting. But people who have never voted before are voting. So they have to worry about that. But also... Why are they picking on the Far East? Because they consider it safe. Because, whoa, would the Japanese really fear to take over, dare to take on the might of the British Empire? No! Doesn't matter if that might looks like a paper tiger. They're not going to do that, are they? They wouldn't. They wouldn't dare. So, here's the thing. Mr. Asquith's in another place. We have te testified that he is presided over the Committee of Imperial Defence. The subject, although discussed, was never entertained by the committee. Well, that's a curious turn of phrase, and it's been discussed multiple times, but it's never been entertained by the committee. That can be interpreted as many things. That can be, it's been discussed several times and been said, well, this is something we're going to have to do in the future, but we don't have the priorities now. We're in the middle of a war in Europe. We don't need to worry about this. We don't need to do this now. It could be taken that it was dismissed as a, lot, a joke, but if it's a joke, why is it coming back multiple times? And you can't really say something has come from nowhere. It's a new proposal if it's been discussed on multiple occasions. Now, of course, he's just used the phrase discussed, so of course he said once. Well, that's what Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Viscount Wimborne has, uh, his lordship has interpreted him as saying. When you go and read Asquith's actual statement, you get the impression that it was discussed on a couple of occasions. It was an interesting point of view. Because there are specific difficulties in defending the Far East, and setting up a Gibraltar of the Far East to control what was the one of the most critical choke points. Singapore is a, a choke point. A critical one for the global trade and the movement of goods. And a critical one for the defence of India and the defence of Australia. Because if you control Singapore, you control the islands between India and Australia. And allow the free movement of supplies back and towards the other side. This is actually what Churchill himself describes at the beginning. One of the links in our international inter-imperial communications and one of the greatest guarantees we can ha give to our Australian dominions is that the British Empire is united. It is linked together and we will proceed to their assistance if they need our aid. They are not cut off. The Empire is not cut off in half and they are not cut off from the British, uh, from the British Empire. I took a look on it as a gateway which enables us to keep in touch with Australia in the South Pacific and also a gateway which can be kept closed to a very large extent and will ensure a very great measure of security in the ocean in the event of dangers arising in China waters with Japan. That's what he said when he first like when he's first like when he's first looking at it. But he only starts looking to cut costs and he gets Well, Churchill is one of those ministers who I would say is more consistently captured by his departments than pretty much any other minister. And he imagines himself expert in all those departments he goes into. Doesn't matter what the department is. Doesn't matter what the role is. The moment he's in them, 
he is an expert in them and he is the most knowledgeable in them and he understands it better than everyone and everything else should bow down to his department's needs. So when he was the Admiralty, when he was Lord of the Admiralty, First Lord, please don't know the difference from First Sea Lord, First Lord of the Admiralty, it's basically it's the senior minister, he was the, world, the expert on naval affairs. He knew more than anyone else. And would interfere quite deliberately. When he's a Chancellor of the Treasury, it's the same thing. And yes, he does have good ideas. He also sometimes has absolutely atrocious and terrible ideas. Now, very quickly he transitions, therefore, because he wants to save the money. And this is the telling point in 1926. If you had foreseen the decision to develop a base at Singapore, be used as a gigantic excuse for building up armaments and that this country would then be invited to pour out money with a view to conducting war at the other end of the world, he would never have agreed to the development of this base. <sighs> He's constant. He is Churchill. And one of the things he is, is, especially by Nimmer's life, very conscious of his position in history. This means he actually worries about Singapore probably more than anything else and how it will be viewed because whilst whilst it is by no means the fault of those in the 1920s that Singapore is not prepared, in play, prepared and properly put in place by 19, 1941 in terms of Singapore itself those are all things which are... Singapore is prepared, it's just badly organised and all sorts of things. And I've done a whole video about that, so I'm not getting into full Singapore now. But... What would I say? I would say... The 1920s defence debates don't help. I would say that Churchill is... Pennywise pound foolish as Chancellor on many things. I'd also say that he shamelessly plays things off against each other, believing peace is going to be lasting. And I would say that he has a blind spot when it comes to the Far East. He consistently underestimates the Japanese. He consistently <sighs> underestimates a power who were our major ally in World War One. He consistently underestimates what is likely to happen and what could happen. And he is not by no means the only one. There are many like him. There are many, many like him who just do not see Japan and the Far East as a threat. You know, one of the interesting things about, well, Wimborne is that further in his speech, he actually describes... Hong Kong as, and Singapore as next door to each other and says, well, the treaty seems we can't develop that, so we'll just go next door and develop it in Singapore. They are thousands of miles apart. If that is next door, what do you think it, What do you think France and the UK across the English Channel are? Do you think they're in the same living room? It's just a case of it's this just absurd. It is. So with that being opposition against any spending and defence at all, and all the other things going on, let's consider why they did, and why they didn't. So, in answer to the first question, well, why go with Singapore? Later on, treaty, and treaty certainly is a big factor into it, in terms of where it's agreed to be upgraded and where you can't. So you can't upgrade Hong Kong. Way high way, of course, isn't really an option, as I've discussed. So, Singapore it is. Location and cost sharing. Australia and New Zealand are putting money towards cruisers. That's another thing Churchill doesn't want to invest in. Please note, Churchill is, is really great when he's Chancellor to check out the Navy. He and BT lock horns quite often, and actually... One of the things I will say is BT shows his good side as a politician because he does get the better of Churchill on several occasions, including during the debate about uh, 
Japan and the Far East and Singapore because uh, he makes the very sensible point it's best time to prepare infrastructure and security uh, and these sort of apparatuses logistics wise in peace rather when, uh, than when there's a threat of war because there might not be a war right now there might not be a war for the foreseeable future that gives you time to prepare it but the thing is the odds were war is coming because there is going to be a war between Japan and America that is something they are certain of. And if there's a war between Japan and America, Britain can't afford to stay out. Britain has to get involved. It either has to get involved to try and bring about peace, or it has to get involved to try in terms of neutrality patrols or something like that. Or it has to pick a side. And it's probably going to pick America, even if it had an Anglo-Japanese alliance. It's probably going to pick America, as long as America doesn't actually start the war. If they start the war, then they'll go neutral and point out the alliance only allows guaranteed entry in the case of you facing off against any two powers rather than one. It's a way to keep war as to stop people bringing their allies. For Japan, it's a really good alliance. For Britain, it's a fairly decent alliance. Basically means if Britain's just fighting one power, then they don't. They have no need for Japan. They'll probably have enough to deal with any one power, more than enough to deal with any one power. Same with Japan. If they're dealing with one power, they're probably okay. Moment everyone brings an ally. Hello, have you met my friend? In if it's the case of Britain, your Far East Empire will be gone in five minutes because Japan has enough forces and enough logistics and industry to be able to do that. In the case of Japan, oh, uh, so you think you're going to use naval means to get to us? Have you met the Royal Navy? They're smiling at you. And Japan had been part of the First World War. They had they had, had the crack anti-submarine force in the Mediterranean at one point. They've been a really good force for anti-submarine warfare in the Mediterranean. Now, cost sharing is always an interesting thing. And cost sharing, as I've put up there, is the only option which you can really change. Because the treaty won't change. The treaty is an international agreement and it just won't be able to change it. It really won't. And we can't change geography. Hand wavium, the moment you start changing geography around with hand wavium, you have completely altered the planet. And completed all, altered all sorts of things. So... What we have to do is change the cost sharing factor, which means we have to say that Australia has to be willing to take on more of the costs of the base. Now that would have changed things, because while Singapore is perfect, and Singapore would still need to be developed to an extent, the moment Australia said, we'll take on the cost of building, I don't know, the, the docks and all the infrastructure positions, all you have to do is provide the personnel. British government would have been there like a shot. I mean, honestly. Churchill would have been biting their hands off. Because Churchill's main thing is the cost. If someone else is prepared to take on the cost of things, he'll be jumping on it. And the thing is, then you still get your base in the Far East. It's not in as good a location, because Singapore is the most sensible location to have it. Singapore is. Please don't get this wrong. There is nothing more... Sydney is... The same issues as Trim Commonly, it's extra distance away. Sydney is extra distances to support. Sydney is all sorts of problems that are going to build up. But it's still a base in the Far East. So those people who want a base out there, get a base. Those people who don't want to disrupt the treaty system, don't disrupt the treaty system. Those people who, well, it's further away from Japan. So how can Japan complain about a joint base with the Royal Australian Navy in Australia? They really can't. And... Churchill wouldn't need to pay for it. There's enough political factions in the UK who would see it as advantageous, it would be jumped on. So cost. But how's that going to change things? And what changes if we go for an Australia-based Sydney strategy? Well, for starters, Nelson and Romney don't change. Why can I say they don't change? Well, because we're talking about a strategy which is not really prescribed till 1924. They are both laid down in 1922. You are, by the point of 1924 comes along, you are nowhere near the point at which you can change those significantly. So Nelson and Rodney are the same as they are. In which case, we're probably looking at a cruising speed for any fleet getting out there of less than 16 knots. 
Why less than 16? Well, good question, because at 16 knots, Nelson only can do 7,000 nautical miles. Why does this matter? Well, it's a distance thing. It really is a distance thing. Distance, you're saying? Yes, because distance is the biggest governor of everything. If we expand this out just a quick second and have a look at this before we go back to where you can view the poodle, you'll notice that's the original plan. And roughly, that comes in at roughly 5,365 nautical miles, uh, which is 14 days at 16 knots. In other words, two weeks travel. And that's if Nelson and Rodney do not stop to refuel at Adu Atoll. Battle cruisers, battle and aircraft carriers go north. They go via Trincolalee. The main battle fleet goes to Base T. Um, they both fleets get refueled at Cameron Bay. And by that, in terms of refueling, I mean the British are planning to have their oilers get to those bays, be secured in those bays and refuel there so they can bring the so the fleet is not being restricted by having boilers with it. And so that the fast oilers which are with the fleet can just keep going. Because they're going to be supporting the fleet when it's in further and long its operations. If you're going to Sydney, at sixteen knots, that's nine thousand six hundred and forty four nautical miles and uh, twenty five days. That's not an extra week. That's an extra 11 days. That's not going via Singapore, of course. It's 11 days for travel. So it basically means for a fleet to get out there, you either have to say send it two weeks earlier, or it's going to arrive two weeks later. Now, admittedly, if it's basing from Sydney, then they've got the strategic distance probably to enable them but that means is you're also going to have to think about in terms of your defense of your forces because if you are think, presuming that your fleet would arrive within roughly 20 days at singapore then you're probably presuming that singapore has to survive for at most three weeks at most three weeks of siege before your fleet gets there in fact and that's the Mediterranean fleet first getting there, but the Mediterranean units will get there first. If you're looking at it from the perspective of a fleet going to Sydney, you're going to have to build up all your fortification and defenses, the ideas of them being under siege for months. Because not only is it going to take you the best part of a month to get to Sydney, It's going to be the best part of a month to get from Sydney to anywhere else and work your way up. It's not impossible to do it. It's just not impossible to do it. It's just this is the big reason why you have Singapore versus Sydney. This is one of the reasons why Singapore wins out. That, the differential. One, you're there within two weeks, within roughly twenty days, and a little over a month, you're at you're at other places. In this one, a month is just getting to Sydney from the sewers. From the sewers. So it adds to everything. This is going to have an impact on all your ship design and all your thinking. Because you're A, going to have to start putting in infrastructure even more fuel than the Singapore strategy called for. You're going to start basing even more fuel out there because the ships are going to go through it more. Them, more because they're going at starting off of going a longer range. But you're also going to have to look at your ship designs and you're going to have to start thinking in longer ranges from the get-go. Now, this is a problem for the British because 
a lot of their naval ships designs a lot of their warships are designed to make use of the advantage the british have in terms of basing okay yes you can say, point out that fuel and feed water do not count in terms of displacement under the washington naval treaty they're not included in sand displacement quite correct hence water as armor however however life doesn't always treat you so nicely and the thing is whilst water and armor don't uh, water and fuel do not count towards your weight you need armor and other things to cover up that fuel and weight uh, that were fuel and water and you need more importantly you need space in the hull for those things which means the more of that you have to carry the more you have to defend and the larger the vessel you have to build. So the more of your tonnage goes into hull weight. Instead of other things. This is all going to have a knock-on impact. What's the big thing that's going to see does? You're probably going to see something different with the county class. Um, the county class could manage... 8,000 nautical miles at 10 knots, or 2,300 nautical miles at 30 knots. That's a nice start, and believe me, I'm, I'm not going to critique it, but it's not enough for operations if your route of maneuver is, instead of being roughly 5,365 nautical miles, or if we consider it, Double the distance that can be transitioned at 30 knots, roughly. Well, a little over double distance. So probably something they can do comfortably with a stop in the middle at 20, 25, uh, 20 22 knots. If they can do 2,300 nautical miles at 30 knots, you drop that down to 25 knots, you can probably get a fairly hefty distance going. To something which, even at 10 knots, they couldn't get it done. And again, take 10 knots. Dropping from 16 knots down to 10 knots, that's going to add a lot of time onto that. So what do I think gets added on? Well, you could get extra fuel storage added on that they just connect in somehow. Kind of like their armor that magically slots in, they actually have fuel tanks which magically slot in. But honestly, the British are going to be needing to think through a lot of their designs because their metric of movement is going to be this. That's the thing, which is often forgotten about the Singapore strategy and how it affects ship design, is the movement of the fleet from Suez to Singapore becomes the metric of movement for the fleet. It's like today, if you look in the Royal Navy. Look at all the stats, look at the distance of the UK to the Falkland Islands, and then look at the Navy. Then look at the stats again. Then you start to realize, hang on, there's a theme going on here. Oh, yes, the unit of movement for the Royal Navy that they now factor into every single ship design is getting to the Falklands. It's getting to the Falklands. That's been a legacy ever since 1982. It caused a redesign in the Type 23s. It caught, uh, drove a massive portion of the Type 45 design. It's there in every single design since. And in the 1920s and 30s, the design factor that they were considering was the distance from the sewers to Singapore. And whether it could do that in, it could do, uh, the ships could do that in one stop or would require multiple stops. But they wanted to get there quickly. Now, of course, you can say, well, Alex, well, they could, they, they just have to have more stops along the way, and they'd have to fill up with fuel on those occasions so they could run it faster. True. But the advantages to Singapore, as you can see from that map, there are multiple positions for the British to stop at before they get to Singapore that are British controlled. If you look at these islands, some of them are the Dutch islands. The Netherlands might well be neutral. They might well not be something that are part of this operation. 
So that's going to have an impact. It's going to have an impact on your ship design. It's going to have an impact on everything. Also, interestingly enough, it might well change the calculation in terms of high pressure steam or very high pressure steam. The British were happy to settle for the engines they did have because they didn't need the same amount of fuel efficiency as the Americans needed to be able to operate successfully. If this becomes the unit of measurement in terms of their metric for their distance to ships, suddenly you have pretty much 10,000 nautical miles as your unit of measurement at 16 knots. Preferably faster. They'd like to be able to do that at 24 knots. Which would cut it down. Raise it by 50%, cut it down by a third. Raise the speed by 50%, cut the time down by a third. So you'd be cutting it down to roughly 16 days. That's getting far closer to the two-week mark. Far, far closer. And that's what the Royal Navy would desperately prefer. Next thing you have with Sydney is the fact that their base is not one base. It's got the Cockatoo Island... Sorry. <sighs> Just realised it was Cockatoo Island rather than Cockatoo Island. So... In Sydney, naval base is two separate points. You have naval base, which is Garden Island, and you have the Cockatoo Island Naval Dockyard. Now, the thing is, if you start investing in these areas, you do have a lot of infrastructure industry to build for, from far more than you already have it set in the present of Singapore. So this is an advantage. But expect these to grow. Okay, you're going to need dry docks and facilities that can take battleships and aircraft carriers, and they're going to need to be built in. Yes, you can send floating dockyards, but honestly, the point about this facility is you don't need to send in a floating, a floating dry dock. Australia has the space, has the capacity to support proper, permanent structures, which are far better. You'll probably still send the portable ones, because let's be honest, you'll probably need more than you can build. But if Australia's prepared to build them, you could build some really interesting facilities here. And that's going to help. The level of infrastructure you're also going to need is going to need to be more than you would have had at Singapore. Again, because of the distance. So, if you think about it, if you're operating from a distance which is an extra you know, 4,000 odd miles from where you want to be, you are going to need that much more force in order to generate enough force forward. And to also be dealing with the stuff being sent back to you, to get it through, repaired, and sent forwards. You're going to need to have a consequently larger force. You're really going to need a consequently larger force. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say you want to have three ships forward of, let's say they are, let's go with capital ships, just to make it easy, let's go with battleships, okay? You want three forward. Okay. Well, now, if you want to guarantee you have at least three in that fleet, if any of them get damaged, they have got to go all the way back to here. So A, you're going to need some r r mobile naval sort of basing facilities anyway, like you did have. And you're probably going to need some stuff at Singapore, because that's going to be a stopping point on the way. But they're going to need to come into here. And they're going to be that much more damaged, because they're going to have done that much further distance. It's going to be that much longer for them to get back here. So that means you're going to need, consequently need more vessels available to go forward to guarantee those free. Because it's going to take longer for them to get back and get repaired. And even for maintenance and service, it's going to take longer for them to get back, get repaired, and be held forward. So you're going to need more in that movement. Instead of being able to maintain those free forward with six ships, you might need five or... Well, no, six ships. Instead, of, you might need eight, nine... Sorry, I was doing a maths of the three forward, how many in transit, one in da one, uh, one to two damaged. Da, 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 it, it works out. It's going to add in quite dramatically. It's not impossible. But let's put it this way. If you could afford to have one major fleet dry dock at 
Singapore, you probably need to have two or three in Sydney. And the odds are they build them at Cockatoo Island. Honestly, the odds are they do build it at Cockatoo Island, because let's be honest, that will be the most defended you can put it. It's going to be so far in the bay that, frankly, anyone getting there is going to be... Well, they're, they're going to accomplish the feat of something to go down the ages. And I'm sure whatever parts of them will be memorialized, that are left will be more memorialized after the kangaroos have got through them, because honestly, the cockatoos, the kangaroos, and the various other creatures of Australia are always far more of their defensive formations. And let's just hope no one invading comes across the emus, because it would be very sad for humans to have to learn the lesson again that emus do not lose wars. So it can help. It's certainly got a lot of space. That's the thing about Sydney Harbour. It's a lot of space. But also, as these pictures do demonstrate, it's also quite built up. It's got a lot of its own activity going on there. It's quite an important commercial hub. And that's going to have an impact on Sydney in that if you have a larger naval facility going through there, a lot more of the naval forces there, more of a naval focus, that is going to affect the amount of space and the space you have in certain areas for your commercial interests. And it's going to require a lot of government funding. This is going to mean the Navy is going to have to be the cornerstone of Australian government defence. That could mean that the Army and the Air Force get even less funding. It might mean they have to do higher taxes. And how popular is that going to be? Is that going to lead to changes in government? More often changes in government as they can't deliver on their promises because they have to pay for the costs. And yes, at its certain point, Singapore was forecast to cost £100 million. It cost more than that, but of course it did. It's a government contract. And it got spun out and debated for so long that that's one of the problems. You estimate the cost of in year A. But by the time you're actually placing the orders, it's year B, because you've been debating... And then because you build in phases, you're actually paying for it in year C, by which time inflation, lots and lots of different ideas and perspectives have got involved, and it's grown massively. You do sometimes wonder why we don't do more projects like we did with MI6, where you just pay for everything up front in one go. MI6 is headquarters, the new one, uh, well, the newish one. It's a new. It's it's the one they're still in now, on the Thames. It's paid for all in one go, and that's very unusual for British government contracts. They usually pay for things in phases. Fifteen-inch guns. Here is an interesting question. What do you do about fifteen-inch guns? You see, the thing is, you still need them for Singapore. I know, this is going to shock people. Even if you don't have the base there, you still need 15-inch guns for Singapore. Why? Because they help you in controlling the straits. Because if you don't have 15-inch guns there, then you need to have far larger ships there far earlier, which means you need to forward base them more often, which means you need to detach fleet units from the home and Mediterranean fleets, which is cheaper to have 15-inch gun forts sitting in Singapore, which is a place you know you'll need them, or to constantly rotate out a battleship there and have one, have battleships less battleships in home fleet and less in the Mediterranean fleet, and probably have just enough battleships there that they're just enough of a concentration to be attractive to an enemy to uh, preemptively strike, but not enough to actually be able to do anything about it. And if Sydney's your principal naval base. You'd need 15-inch guns to defend that. You'd need 15-inch guns. You'd also need more of the 9.2s and 9.2-inch guns. 9.4s or 9.2s? I think it's 9.2s going around at that time. Um, inch guns going around. you need more of them. You would need more of those guns going around to defend Sydney and to defend the other areas of Sydney. And other parts of Australia, because you're going to raise them up the target list. You might even need to 
do similar as you do with Singapore anyway, and offer Australia a Gurkha Brigade. That might be a necessity in order to make their security strong enough. Or maybe even a division. In which case, that's more costs, because you don't just have the cost of building the infrastructure, you have the cost of defending the infrastructure. This means the Australians are going to have to invest in fighters, as when the British are. The Australians are going to have to have a fighter allocated when the British are doing it, they're building those fighters up. The one thing about Singapore is it's entirely dependent on British and the Australians and what they can sharp with. Well, if Australia are not defending something else, they're defending their own territory, they're going to have to show up with more. And they're still probably going to have to force this at Singapore. Because Singapore is still a major choke point and still needs to be controlled because if we go back to this point here, if you want to rush your fleet along, you want to make sure no one interferes with that fleet moving past Singapore, don't you? You want to make sure it can maneuver as quickly as possible straight past there. You don't want to have that problem. So that means you need to defend Singapore. And you need 15 inch guns for both. And we haven't even really started. We haven't even really started on defense of Sydney as a whole. Because Sydney is going to be a critical place. You're going to need submarines operating out there. You're going to need the full enchilada. You're going to need boom defense systems. You're going to need forts put in that can uh, cover multiple entrances. Because if you are a principal strategic base for the British Empire in the Far East, you are a critical asset. It's often forgotten just how much money and defense was sunk into Singapore. For it to fall like it did is, abs is almost absurd, but that was mainly because the psychology of the leadership had already been crushed. They hadn't been prepared for what was coming, and I've talked about it before. It's, it's just a whole mixture of things go wrong there. There's all, so all, there's all sorts of different problems. But... What we're talking about, if you're putting into, if you're putting this into Sydney, is you've got a massive civilian population as well, which are exposed. You're going to need to defend those, because you can't have a base defended and then not have the civilians defended. So Sydney as a whole needs to be defended. I hope also with the major empire base being there that the infrastructure links between Sydney and uh, Canberra are significantly vastly improved by that I mean and this is a completely aside but as someone who got the train from Sydney beautiful station arrived in Canberra I'd like to say that there are branch line stations in the UK which are slightly more impressive looking than Canberra's box. Um, and I don't mean that in a nasty way. I mean that honestly, it, it doesn't show a, a care for the passenger traveller in Canberra. But leaving that to one side, you need to do these things sort of up, uh, these things up in this scenario because you're going to have also a major British naval command base there. Because if you base in Australia, are you putting an Australian admiral in charge of the British forces? Probably not. Probably you're going to have to set up a joint. I don't know. What do you call it? Joint British Empire command. Joint Empire. Joint Empire forces command. A joint command structure is going to have to be set up in Sydney to coordinate it all. It's going to have to have a senior admiral. This is going to have another effect on defence, because it's going to mean that instead of it being a vice admiral, or similar, who was the senior officer in charge as the CNC China, or occasionally it's a full admiral, it would probably need to be an admiral of the fleet. You'd be probably be talking it would be a five-star command. To use modern parlance. Why? Because it's going to be a joint force. You're going to want to have a admiral as a fleet commander, but you're going to need a commander in chief of the joint forces. By the way, this has all sorts of interesting things for the Second World War because 
if you have them based on Sydney and the entire area is divided up into that smart ABDA command, I have a feeling Paul MacArthur finds himself as deputy commander. Especially if the British forces, the British naval force out there has survived. And this is another fact that we have to think about. But defense of Sydney as a whole becomes a major factor. And the idea of submarines being able to get into Sydney and wander around as they did here, just not a viable, ent a viable thing to entertain. It's not viable. They would have to be stopped. So we've already mentioned some of the ship design impacts. Well, 15,600 nautical miles at 10 knots, that's fine if your m main route of measurement is going to be roughly 2,500 nautical miles to do 5,000 nautical roughly a little over 5,000 nautical miles. Yeah, you can do that because you can do that for those 5,000 nautical miles at distinctly faster than 10 knots because it's about roughly a third of the distance. If you're talking about having to do, being able to do two thirds of the distance, well, that's that's not going to give you much of a speed bump. And again, the differentials in terms of manoeuvring. So, this is going to affect the King George V class. Interesting enough, this could have an effect on them in that it could be decided that they need to be slightly narrower of beam. Because if you make a ship slightly narrower, you can make it more fuel efficient going through uh, going through the water. But if it's narrower you don't necessarily want a quadruple turret. So does this mean triple 16 inches up here? I would argue unlikely. I would argue it's unlikely also the British go for a triple 14 inch because 9 14 inch guns do not help them. They might. They might. Original, I remember, their original plan was three quadruple turrets of 14 inch, but 9 14 inch guns... Don't give them an equivalent firepower to nine 16 inch guns. 12 does. Nine 15 inch guns, you could fit that in a fairly narrow profile, and that would then have the advantages of, upgrade, of being able to upgrade the Queen Elizabeth, etc., and would also be a step down in disarmament. And actually, conversely, going for a 15 inch ceiling rather than 16 inch might actually be viable. People might actually accept it as an idea. That has all sorts of impacts, if that does occur for it. But pretty much Britain will want them to be slightly less beamy. Because they want to make them slightly longer. They want to have slightly more fuel. And they want to make them slightly more fuel efficient going through the water. So you could be talking about higher pressure engines, higher pressure boilers. Throwing turbines more efficiently. You could be talking about more fuel being carried. You could be talking about maybe 15 inch guns in free triple turrets. As you're coming to fits. Why? As, as your King George V. I just realised I said that rather quickly. Why am I saying that? Because that fits. That also probably will have an effect on their top speed. Their top speed could go up to 29, even 30 knots. With those changes. And it fits with the need of the range. But it won't be just in terms of capital ships. The figure given for tribal class destroyers is, of course, 5,700 nautical miles at 15 knots. Again. Well, that's a fact, a distance for... Well, it should get you, broadly speaking, it, it will get you to Singapore. It will get you there when you consider the distance to Singapore is 5,365 nautical miles. So, if you've got a fuel a fueling position, you can go a lot faster between there. But think about it from the perspective of now we've got to get to Australia. What's the range going to need to be? Range is going to need to be more than nine thousand six hundred forty-four nautical miles. So, the Royal Navy is going to have to be looking at ten thousand nautical miles potential ranges for their destroyers. This is going to have an effect on all their design levels. It's going to have effect on 
probably their destroyer sizes, but also their destroyer hull shapes. Which again, could be really quite interesting. I think the biggest effect you'll see there will be in aircraft carriers. Because at that point, aircraft carriers are going to be needed to cover the, pretty much the entire trip out. Because bases in Singapore, Ceylon, etc. can protect you for quite a large chunk of the trip across the Indian Ocean from individual raiders who've managed to get in the Indian Ocean, submarines, those things, and providing the patrols. If you haven't got those covers, then your carriers are going to need to do it. This is going to cause a major change of British strategy going into the 1930 London Naval Treaty, and especially 1936 London Naval Treaty. The thing is, this might set out as being a good idea to try and save money, but it's probably going to cost more money in the end. Which probably won't worry Churchill that much, because he's no longer Chancellor by this point. So it's other people having to foot the bill. And he'll be very happily telling them they need to pay the bill. Because the moment he's out of office, that's pretty much what he does. He turns around and tells people, with no gall at all, you need to be spending more money on defence, but you've been cutting it for the last few years. Yes, but now I'm not Chancellor and I'm not responsible for it. I, you need to spend more money on defence. We're not secure. We're not safe. One of the ideas he actually get, puts forward at one point in his arguments is that Britain could never defeat Japan. That was actually one of his arguments for not spending money. There's no point spending money if we couldn't actually defeat them. Then in five minutes later, he's saying we're so powerful we'd never have to fight them because they wouldn't want to fight because they'd lose. It's it's amazingly joyous reading some of his arguments and some of his positions. What's the strategy of Japan going to be? Well, freaking Australia's a problem. They can get to Australia. They can get to Sydney slightly easier than they can to Singapore and le a lot less easily though than they can get to Trin Connolly. But there's a problem with getting to Sydney. If you go for Hawaii, you go across, across that open ocean. If you go for Sydney, you have to do a dog leg trip to try and get to cross that ocean. And you have to hope there's no one on any of those little islands who's going to raid you up Sydney and go... Do you know there's a massive fleet just past me? And there's a lot of people on little islands with radios. I know it's a World War II enduring World War II invention, but no. There are lots of people with little radios on lots of islands. Those hearts are all places we visited on the trip, by the way. I had left them in because I just thought, eh, it'll be fun. So what does Japan do? Well, if Japan is attacking down through Malaysia, because they've got French Indochina, and they're attacking along that peninsula again, they can still go for Singapore. They could still go for Singapore. The thing is, while they're going for Singapore, the British might actually have managed to reinforce Australia. And then they're going to have to deal with the fleet coming at them. It... it makes it very problematic for Japan. Their other option is then, instead of doing Operation C and going into the Indian Ocean, they could well try and launch a massive strike on Sydney, like they did on Pearl Harbor. That would be the sensible plan, honestly. And that could lead to a massive fleet battle in the Coral Sea. Especially as with Singapore, or with Sydney being so far away, the American forces and naval forces could well have fallen back on Sydney. It's not like they have to fall into Singapore, which is away from the United States. They'd be falling back towards the United States and towards Sydney. There's also a difference in terms of command structure at this point, because, as said, one of the things that affects the British in the Far East is its own command structure, and there's the disparity of command. If you've had Sydney as your headquarters, you've had to set up that joint command structure. You've got to have a, a, a fleet, a, a, a Admiral the Fleet out there, a fire. That's pretty much your most important thing you're going to have to have out there heading it. 
which means that even if you do kill an admiral at sea, you're probably not going to kill the CNC because he'll be commanding from Sydney. Especially by this point in 1940, by the point in 1941. And so you're not going to have those disparate, those falling apart of command, those scrambling to rearrange command structures because there's going to be someone above it who's going to go, no, this person's in charge. Already there, that's their entire job. And to deal with the politicians. The main fun is thing is going to be who that is. I have personal bets over who that might be. And their relationship with MacArthur. Depending on who that is, they could absolutely squash MacArthur. I, I would say Twit is a good example. Uh, could definitely do some nasty damage to MacArthur in a political fight. As for Japan's strategy, well, probably it's got to be an Operation C attack on India, uh, attack on Australia rather than the Indian Ocean. It might be something different, but it, they're most likely going to have to deal with a fleet that's concentrated there, which is going to be probably the Allied fleet. The Americans are probably going to form up there as well. Because if they fall back, they're conceding. They, if they go forward too far, they've got no support. If they go to Sydney, they look like they're pushing forward. And that's assisting, of course, the submarine forces, which could also be operating in Australia at this point. Force Z is an interesting one because, well, historically, they're sunk on the 10th of December 1941. And the invasions happens on the 8th of December. Well, let's first go back to composition of Force C because... If you consider Force Z is forming up in Sydney now, you've got all the forces that are operating elsewhere in Southeast Asia that would be between it and Malaysia if it's heading to Malaysia, that it would gather up under its wings as it goes. Instead of it waiting, instead of those forces having to report to it in Singapore, it would be gathering them up as it went. That's going to change its composition. It's going to have cruises, etc. It's also going to mean there's time for other things to turn up. And, furthermore, with Australia paying for the infrastructure there and building infrastructure, you've probably got a major yard there, a major facility, which will have been a long way away from the combat zone. So a lot of the ships which were sent across the Atlantic to America, especially the ones from the Mediterranean fleet, might well have been sent to Australia instead. After all, why send it to America when you can send it to Australia and get it fixed up when you've got all the infrastructure facilities there? Because you've built all of them. Or rather, the Australians have paid to build them all. So that means things like HMS Illustrious, etc. might well be already in Australia. So instead of her having to come and join them, She's already there. Same with Indomitable. And Formidable. But, you know, actually, Formidable more than Indomitable. I don't think... No, ind more Formidable. Formidable, yeah. Indomitable's there, isn't she? So, yeah, the, the thing is, these ships, Formidable, could well have been out there. War Spite could have been out there. All sorts of vessels could have been out there being repaired. Force Z, when it's put together, might not be Repulse and Prince of Wales. It might be whatever ships are actually already out there. Titularly part of that force out there, but actually out there to be repaired and worked up. So instead of being two ships which have been sent over there, it could be ships which were already there, and those could be a lot more powerful. Because whilst Prince of Wales is very good, Repulse dances like... And I, I always use the same image, and I'm going to keep using this. If you're looking at Strictly Come Dancing UK, Dancing with Stars in the United States, imagine this. You've got a young male sportsman, usually. I'm going to use the male sportsman because the way they tend to dance. They have no rhythm. They just look good and have muscles and basically are moving a spot. And you have this usually... Mid to late 30s, professional female dance with them. 
who is absolutely amazing, who will literally be twirling all sorts of things around him, doing all those tricks and flicks. And basically, they do so well that all those male sportsmen almost has to do stand there and, look, and, they, and they look good because that person's dancing so well. Well, that's Repulse and the Prince of Wales when they're under air attack. Literally, Repulse is spinning, doing, doing all sorts of things and really dodging it. And Prince of Wales is trying to blast away as best she can. Well... You might have those ships still there as part of the formation. You might not. There's, there's all sorts of options here if you have built up Sydney as your alternative because the level of infrastructure you're going to build up there is going to be different and therefore than you had at Singapore. and It's going to be Singapore plus what you have at Bombay and Madras in many ways at this time. In which case you have got a facility which can repair major battle, a major ca capital units and aircraft carriers which is a long way from the war zone and is far easier for the Mediterranean forces to be got to because you don't have to take them around the Cape. If you think about them, if you don't have to take them around South Africa how much easier is it to get those ships to safety? Yes, it's a few days, but let's be honest, it's far easier to get there. So then we get to the invasion of Malaya on the 8th of December, 1941. Here is the other factor with 4C and the response to the invasion of Malaya. It's going to be 11 days at 18 knots before the Royal Navy can get there. So that means all the weird things of command which happen when there's the first invasion, because traditionally they are actually lost on the 10th of December. And part of the reason they're lost on the 10th of December is because of all the arguments and disputes going on in command structure, all the confusion going on in command structure. Well, A, the, the person in charge in Malaya is going to be just in charge in Malaya at this point because there is the force, the CNC, British, uh, British Empire forces, sitting down in Sydney who's going to be coordinating, who's going to have a senior land force advisor, a senior this, a senior that, and is going to be coordinating everything. So the person in Malaysia goes from being a CNC to being... You are the commander of Malaysian ground forces or the commander of the force in Malaysia. You're that, you know, front commander, but you're not the overall commander. So, A, you just do deal with that and you don't have to worry about the politics. That's what the guy in Australia is doing. But, B, you have a framework and a structure to go into because that's what the person in Australia staff has been doing for the last 20 years. Working it out. By the time the fleet turns up, the Japanese are on, well, that would be the west coast of Malaysia, going down towards Singapore. So the fleet goes up the straits and they can bombard them on the coast and force them inland, where it's far slower going. And who knows what forces they gathered at this point. As said... There are forces which are going to be there under maintenance. There are, the force seas competition is going to change, but also they're going to have taken 11 days to get there. They could have gathered all sorts of things with them on the way. And even if you've had a scenario where force C has existed and has been forward-based, again, there are going to be other forces which have been down making use of that infrastructure because I cannot see a scenario where they do not make use of that infrastructure. Because as I said... You can go, well, well, you know, they go to America because that frees up resources in the UK. It does. And because that frees up infrastructure in the UK. It does. But so does the stuff in Australia if you already built it. And it's already there. And the thing is, Australia is just as out of the firing line as the United States is for most of the start of, of 1939 to 41. And Australia is part of the British Empire. And Australia is probably going to do as good a deal, if not better. And they're going to be built to British standards. So you're not going to have any of the problems you have the Americans of converting British imperial standards, uh, in imperial measurements, to American imperial measurements and finding out the difference. So Malaysia becomes an invasion of Malaysia, even if it takes place at the same time as it did becomes a very different prospect, and the fleet either turns up after 11 days, in which case you have a far clearer picture, you have a far better understanding of what the aviation units are doing, 
and you've probably brought some stuff with you, and you probably do have an aircraft carrier with you as well, and you know where the uh, know where the Japanese are far more than you do on day two of the invasion, because also you've got a different structure in terms of the command structure going on, or there are reinforcements coming in there close by, and there is a senior command in place. There is a command structure in place who can start relieving people, who can start putting moving people around command the command structures and putting them in charge. Because you will have had to turn, in effect, the entirety of and I have I think I have this one back here. This one. You have had to turn New Zealand, Australia, China, and East Indies stations into an effect one Far East command. So you will have, whilst you will still probably have those still different stations and the station commanders of British forces, you will have a command and quarter headquarters in Sydney that will have had to have existed for pretty much the entire time you've had that base because otherwise you are giving that base entirely over to the Australian government to run and therefore it's a bit problematic for the Royal Navy and British to be using it as much as they're going to be. So you've had to set up a joint command structure for that scenario. Well, that's going to be the CNC Far East, British Empire forces. That is going to be the senior officer who co who is going to coordinate all of them. That's going to be probably one of the most powerful positions in the British Armed Forces and British political structure at that time. To such an extent that I wouldn't be surprised if they had a senior ambassador attached to them. A senior diplomat. Either they would be theoretically the you know the person sent to Australia as the ambassador, as the high commissioner to Australia or something like that, but they would be a very senior diplomat involved in that structure, because they would be that powerful. They would basically be setting naval policy and British def British defence policy for half a world. And they would be very powerful in terms of their in their relationship with the. British Indian government, the British, the Australian government, and New Zealand government, and all the other, all the other colonies and colonial and Dominion governments in the area, they just because they'd be in charge of coordinating all their forces in the time of war. So basically, when you're asking what forces do we need, well, who's the authority you're going to go to for it? You're going to ask the person who's in charge of coordinating them all to go. What do you need? And they're going to give their opinions. So that is going to be a very, very powerful post, and actually could be almost, in terms of British terminology, it could supplant the Mediterranean fleet as the Golden Road to the First Sea Lord's office. Because if you, it's probably going to be a naval officer, because let's be honest, in this time period, that is what the Royal Britain's going to pick for it, all repeatedly. It is a naval area. In which case that will become almost a golden road to the first sea lord's office, or possibly something which the former first sea lord goes and does. It could well be a case of you've done your time as first sea lord. If you've done really well, you're promoted to fleet admiral of the fleet, and you're sent over to command this area. In which case you have a problem that the person in charge is the former first sea lord, who is basically now outranking the people back home. The Royal Navy doesn't tend to like that idea, so it probably turns it around the other way, and that, that person is next in line to be First Sea Lord. Okay, so we're at the summary. And, well... This is where things get really interesting. Because what is the big change? The big change is just command structure. You know, the thing is, you have Ian Hamill write this. The years 1924 to 1929, in particular, were an exceptionally peaceful and optimistic era in international relations, and such a risk seemed eminently reasonable. The Foreign Office's predictions about the situation in the Far East were a reflection of the situation. Even when Japan beset by the World Economic Depression, abandoned its liberal regime and embarked on a policy of aggression by advancing into Manchuria in 1921. A period of exactly 10 years was to elapse before it struck directly at British interests. Nevertheless, 
During the troubled years of the 1930s, those responsible for British foreign, po foreign defence policies were severely hindered by the legacy of the 20s and all their actions were determined by the necessarily slow pace at which their deficiencies, had been, which had been allowed to develop, could be put right. Winston Churchill was, after all, a man very conscious of historic perspective, and it is in this context that his feelings at the time of the fall of Singapore and after may have included reflections or recollections of his role in the years 1924 to 2009. Well, how do I change that? What do I say? I agree, but I think it glosses over the biggest issue and the big, most interesting thing that come, came about when thinking this through. For me, was the differences of having to have that command structure. Honestly, that command structure rectifies so many of the problems in the Far East almost magically. Simply by having someone and a staff of them whose job it is to coordinate everyone, work together, you get a sort of scenario of almost NATO-like scenario ending up in the British Empire, in that whilst, no, they're not all going to procure the same stuff, and yes, they are going to go all their own way, and yes, not all the theoretical savings and efficiencies are going to be achieved because there are national political interests involved, you're going to get a level of consideration and development going on that's going to change things. And it's kind of like the story of the League of Nations. The League of Nations, there's, there's many cartoons which show it, and it's, a, by the way, League of Nations, if you're not sure about it, is a proto-United Nations organization in some regards, and set up post-World War One. The United States didn't join. They... Wilson, President Wilson, put forward and argued for it, but the United States didn't join because he died. Well, there's often cartoons depicted of the missing piece is of this, you know, wonderful arch, Keystone is the United States, etc. And there is some measure in that. There is some measure in that. But the thing is... It brings you back to a similar idea with Singapore. Churchill and a lot of those people debating the, uh, the funding managed to ghost on the funding, but didn't stop the base being where it was. But the going still on the funding, the debates and the ongoing political discourse and the, discussion, and the realities of where it was put meant they could avoid setting up that command structure. And that's why when we get to World War II, you have a combined army and air force command structure in the Far East. But the Navy aren't. And the Navy are the critical enabling asset that, are that pretty much everyone's waiting for. And you can argue that one of the big reasons for the fall of Singapore is the psychology of the loss of the Royal Navy's 4C. Because of how that affects the command structure. And they are lost because of the issues between these command structures because of the information flow not going properly, because it's not being organized properly. And having a command structure above that, having had something in place for 20 odd years, etc., that doesn't necessarily mean that doesn't occur, but it does mean that there are going to be practices and things in place which are going to make it less likely to happen. And it means there's going to be people watching that if it does happen, to try and correct it before it causes a problem. The big thing about 4C is they get a message which is no air is available. That has been uh, that has been because a badly worded message was given to the naval personnel that no aircraft were available, meaning no strike aircraft were available. Air to fighter defense, fighter aircraft were available. But the people giving it were only worried about strike power. They weren't thinking about fighter power. So they were telling them, oh, there's no strike. They were presuming Navy would understand that fighters were still available. Well, Navy aren't going to understand that. Navy get told there's no air available. They presume there's no air available. And you can also understand the RF's perspective because they believe fighters were, of course fighters are available. If we don't make fighters available, we're sending off to your deaths. But you need to actually say that. You need to confirm that. And you need to have a worded a properly worded document and which means you need to have a structure and you need to have some kind of interface and the really interesting thing is if you have that command structure if you have that joint command 
then a lot of the issues you have necessarily turning up in World War II in Army, Navy, Air Force coordination and cooperation might not happen. Although you do probably turn the commander-in-chief, as I said, my suspicion is that they would be a naval officer. The Far East, and that would be the scenario you'd get. But I wouldn't be surprised if once you have one such command set up, that other such joint commands are set up. Because the Army and Air Force will want to have similar commands. I think the Air Force would try and move for Middle East Command. Home Command would be a whole, whole maelstrom. And would probably fall down to the chiefs, uh, fall to the various defense chiefs. But... But I could see other areas of the world being divided up. And I could see them pushing for it. The consequences of a Sydney strategy are massive. Sydney is nowhere near as sensible a ge geographical base to put as Singapore. Okay, let's get that out of the start. Wait, nowhere. It's far more sensible to have it as Singapore. And if you can have Singapore and have that joint command structure, that would probably be the best thing you could do. But the second best thing you can do, honestly, potentially, is Sydney. Because if, especially the Australian government prepared to invest in the, in the infrastructure, and that's the only reason they get it rather than Singapore. Because Singapore were basically giving the land to the British for free. So that was the financial incentive to go with Singapore. If Australia's for then who knows how strong Australia and Sydney gets built up to be. So... With all that in mind, let's get on to today's question. The question that I'm going to ask you, because that's all I always end all my videos with, is a, with a question. And so this video was about Sydney as the alternative strategy. And I've done some videos about Singapore as a strategy and how that worked out. Well, the other front runner for me is always Trin Connolly. And... I think with Trin Connolly, Connolly, you you might you wouldn't have to have the joint command structure set up because that would be very much a British with everyone filtering into it. But I'd like to see your opinions of this scenario with Trim Connolly as the base chosen rather than Singapore or Sydney. I'd love to see what you think it would have happened and how you think it could have worked out. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Let's see what next and what else do we have coming up. Next week we have 21st Century Sea Power, Reimagining Corbett and Cable. I'm going to be re-recording that on Monday. I know I'm going to be re-recording that on Monday. I'm watching it through at, uh, on the trains on... Well, we'll have watched it through on the train coming up to, uh, coming, uh, up to London on uh, Friday. And I'll be watching it on more trains on Sunday. And I know by the time it gets to Monday I'm going to want to re-record that. It's just what happens with me. And next week is Everything a Shan Horse. Journey standardizes on one hull for capital ships and carriers. I'll also add before I go that Brew Ships 129, it, depending on my trains and whether I'm which part of the country I actually end up in on Sunday, might actually be delayed or supplanted by a key ships premier. A, a, a key ships um, premier because um, it's going to depend on timings and it's going to depend on the railways running to time where I'm going to be. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And thank you as ever for your support. Take care.